Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek, where we discuss theology and apologetics from a charismatic perspective. As many of you know, I prefer to avoid politics on my channel because it's not what I feel I need to be focused on. 25 years ago, I was a political junkie debating politics in chat rooms on a daily basis. After Bush won re-election in 2004 and the operation in Iraq turned sour and the economy went south, I had an epiphany about how much time I was wasting with politics and how foolish it is to be a party loyalist. I would cringe any time I heard some minister talk about what a great man Bush was. Even though I voted for Bush twice, I was sick of the guy by the end of his second term and jokingly vowed that I would never vote for him again. I was only partially joking because even though he was constitutionally prevented from running again, I wouldn't have voted for him again even without that restriction. From 2004 until 2020, I didn't vote because I was so sick of American politics. And in the eight years of running this channel, I've only discussed politics when I felt that there were spiritual implications, like when Roe v. Wade was overturned, or after Biden was inaugurated when I addressed the Trump prophets. So today, I'm going to dive into politics again, because I feel that there's something that has to be addressed. As we all know, Trump has now been indicted on charges relating to the January 6th Capitol riot, which the prosecutors are calling an insurrection. When I did the video addressing the failed Trump prophecy shortly after Biden was sworn in, some people said that the election was stolen and that the prophets weren't wrong and that I would have egg on my face for saying that they were. Well, that was three years ago now, and Biden is still president, and the military operation that was supposed to restore Trump to office never happened. As for the election being stolen, I would like to go on record saying that I'm convinced that there was a lot of shady stuff going on. But that doesn't change the fact that Biden won. The presidential elections take place in the first week of November. As you probably know, the winner is determined through the Electoral College rather than by popular vote. So each state has until the middle of December to count the votes and submit the results. In the first week of January, those results are certified in a joint session of Congress, making it official. Then the certified winner is sworn in on January 20th. So the election results need to be challenged on a state level during the first five weeks following the election. Once those votes are counted and submitted, it's over. Trump challenged the results in several states and none of those challenges succeeded. So like it or not, according to our process, Biden won. Fair or not, Biden won. But rather than accept defeat, Trump summoned his supporters to Washington to protest the certification on January 6 in hopes that members of Congress would reconsider submitting their results and maybe investigate the allegations of fraud a bit more. If that didn't happen, he reasoned that maybe Vice President Mike Pence, who was designated by the Constitution to oversee the certification, would refuse to certify the results. Trump's lawyers apparently told him that Pence had that authority, according to the Constitution. The process for electing the president and the vice president is found in the 12th Amendment. Well, here's what the 12th Amendment says. Keep in mind that the president of the Senate is the vice president. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, and of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall name in their ballots the person voted for as president, and in distinct ballots the person voted for as vice president, and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president, and all persons voted for as vice president, and of the number of votes for each, which lists they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the votes shall then be counted. And then it goes on to discuss how to resolve what is essentially a tie. So according to the Constitution, the President of the Senate, the Vice President, opens the certificates submitted by all the states and sees that the votes are counted. That's it. 
It says nothing about him having the authority to reject any of those certificates. He basically just does what a presenter at an awards show does. He opens the envelopes and reads the results. Pence realized that he didn't have any constitutional authority beyond that. So he did what he was constitutionally authorized and obligated to do, and no more. And for that, Trump's followers have called him a traitor and a coward. Let me remind you that the reason Trump selected Pence as his vice president in the first place is that Trump had a lot of moral baggage that he brought with him into the campaign. And he needed an evangelical with a squeaky clean image on the ticket with him to solidify the evangelical vote. Pence was loyal to him for four years, despite all of Trump's buffoonery on Twitter and his foul language and his exaggerated claims of the crowd size on Inauguration Day. Pence stood by him through all that, but he refused to go beyond what the Constitution allowed for, despite the pressure that Trump and his supporters applied. It reminds me of the meatloaf song, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Now let's think about this for a minute. If the vice president was authorized to reject the results of any state's election, Al Gore could have rejected the results in 2000 when he was the loser in a contested election. Can you imagine how the Republicans would have reacted if he tried that? Joe Biden was vice president in 2016 when Trump defeated Hillary. What if he had tried to reject the results of the swing states that Hillary lost? Would you have been okay with that? From 1976 to 2004, I considered myself a Republican. And part of being a Republican is you believe in strict constructionism. The belief that the Constitution should be read and interpreted according to the original intent of the Founding Fathers. This is sometimes referred to as originalism. One of the reasons Republicans were so adamant about overturning Roe v. Wade was that there was nothing in the Constitution about a woman's right to an abortion. A liberal court basically just made it up. So if you're opposed to taking liberties with the Constitution on the abortion issue, then to be consistent, you ought to be opposed to taking liberties with the Constitution on the electoral process. Mike Pence is a Republican. And he believes in originalism, and he refused to make up some authority that wasn't granted to the vice president. He's a good Christian man, and it really annoys me to see how so many Christians are singing the praises of Trump and calling Pence despicable names because of their misguided political zeal. Here's what Rodney Howard Brown tweeted in 2021. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't think that there were any shenanigans going on in 2020. I certainly do. Trump had insisted that the Democrats were trying to steal the election with mail-in ballots. The media dismissed that as baseless. But even Democrats have made that observation in the past. In 2005, former President Jimmy Carter and former U.S. Secretary of State James A. Baker III co-chaired the Commission on Federal Election Reform, which produced a report on the U.S. electoral process and recommendations on maximizing ballot access and election integrity. The Carter-Baker report warned, absentee ballots remain the largest source of potential voter fraud. Here's what Trump said about mail-in ballots in his debate with Biden in September of 2020. As far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. A Solicited ballot, okay, solicited is okay. You're soliciting, you're asking, they send it back, you send it back. I did that. If you have an unsolicited, they're sending millions of ballots all over the country. There's fraud, they found them in creeks, they found some with the name Trump, just happened to have the name Trump just the other day in a waste paper basket. They're being sent all over the place. They sent two in a Democrat area, they sent out a thousand ballots, everybody got two ballots. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. Now, I'm not a partisan. I do my best to be fair and objective when I look at the facts. After the election, I looked at the numbers and things just didn't add up. If you go back to the 1976 election between Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, you'll see that the popular vote total was about 80 million. In 1980, it was about 85 million. 
1984, it was about 92 million. In 1988, it was about 90.5 million. In 92, it was about 103.7 million. In 96, it was about 94.5 million. In 2000, it was about 101.5 million. In 2004, it jumped quite a bit, probably because of 9-11 and war. It was about 121 million. In 2008, it was about 119.5 million. In 2012, it was a little under 127 million. And in 2016, it was about 128.7 million. So from 1976 to 2016, the total popular vote went from about 80 million to about 128.7 million, which is an average increase of a little under 5 million votes per election. The biggest increase, as I pointed out, was in 2004, where it jumped about 19 million. Now, the total popular vote in 2020 was 155.5 million. That's an increase of nearly 27 million votes. This is what we call a statistical anomaly. Notice that the most votes any presidential candidate had ever received prior to 2020 was 69.5 million by Obama in 2008. Trump got over 74 million and lost by 7 million? At the most, I would say that there shouldn't have been more than about 145 million votes. That's a difference of 10 million votes that were probably directly attributable to the mail-in ballots. Then figure in the bellwether counties, counties that have a history of voting for the winner. According to 538.com, from 1980 to 2016, 19 counties voted for the winner of the presidential election every single time. The most impressive of those was Valencia County, New Mexico, which voted for the victor in every presidential election from 1952 to 2016. But in 2020, 18 of these 19 bellwether counties voted for former President Donald Trump. Just one, Clallam County, Washington, voted for President Joe Biden. What was the difference about the 2020 election? Well, I think we all know the answer to that, mail-in ballots. States changed their voting laws to allow for people to vote from home during the pandemic. As the Carter Baker report said, and as Trump warned, the mail-in ballots were an invitation to fraud. But since the laws were changed, it was legal. So if Democrats stole the election, they stole it fair and square. But it wasn't just Democrats behind the changes in the voting laws. Republican state representatives went along with it because they didn't want to be accused of killing grandma by forcing her to go outdoors to vote where she would end up dying from the virus. So congratulations, guys. You didn't kill grandma, but you opened the door to massive election fraud. Well done. So what I'm trying to say here is that the problem was on the state level. Once the votes were certified and sent to the Capitol, it was over. All the January 6th stuff with the Stop the Steal campaign and throwing Pence under the bus and the riot at the Capitol was all for naught. It's like throwing a desperation Hail Mary pass at the end of a football game. Nine times out of ten, they fail. The way to address this is to hold the state representatives accountable. We have to insist on election integrity on a local and state level because that's where the fraud will occur. Trump should have used his clout as president to pressure state representatives to oppose the changes in the election laws earlier in 2020. You can't wait until the fraud occurs and then fight. Once that genie is out of the bottle, it's awfully hard to put it back in. How many disputed elections can you think of where the challenge was successful? And if we don't want to see a repeat of 2020 and 2024, We've got to take this issue on with our state representatives now. November of 2024 will be too late. Now let's talk about the so-called insurrection or riot or stop the steal campaign. While I'm of the opinion that the events of January 6th were in fact completely uncalled for, I think it's absurd to portray what happened on January 6th as an insurrection. The last thing that Trump wanted that day was violence. It undermined everything he was trying to accomplish, which is why he ended his speech with peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and 
patriotically make your voices heard. The claims that he was leading an insurrection are clearly politically motivated. Now, I think you could make the argument that Trump was being reckless and irresponsible in summoning hundreds of thousands of supporters to the Capitol to protest the results of the election, which created the conditions for chaos. I think Congress would have been within their rights to censure Trump for that, but impeaching him or accusing him of treason and insurrection when there was no armed assault on the Capitol is a stretch. It's now coming to light that there were a lot of irregularities in the security arrangements that day, which exacerbated the situation. And people have gone to prison for nothing more than walking into the Capitol building amidst all of the confusion that day. Some might even call that entrapment. But there were clearly people there who were troublemakers and deserved to go to prison. There was wrongdoing on all sides. And as I said, it's pretty obvious that these charges were politically motivated. But that doesn't mean that Trump didn't break any laws. The charges against Nixon and the Watergate scandal, obstruction of justice, were absolutely politically motivated. But at the same time, Nixon was probably guilty of obstructing justice, and the Republicans knew it. They informed him that they wouldn't be supporting him during the impeachment process, and he realized that he was going to be found guilty in the Senate, so he resigned. He was spared a criminal trial and potential conviction only because Gerald Ford pardoned him. So just because the charges against Trump are politically motivated, it's quite possible that he will be convicted at some point. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you how strong any of the cases are. I'm just saying that the contempt for Trump has pushed people to violate an honored tradition in this country. We don't lock up our political opponents. From this point on, we're essentially no different from a banana republic where the loser of an election has to flee the country to avoid prison. Did Trump break any laws? Maybe. From what I heard, most presidents and presidential candidates have broken laws. In fact, most Americans have broken the law. There's a book by Harvey Silvergate called Three Felonies a Day that says most of us could be brought up on felony charges based on the expansive nature of our legal and criminal justice systems. Here's what the description says. The average professional in this country wakes up in the morning, goes to work, comes home, eats dinner, and then goes to sleep, unaware that he or she has likely committed several federal crimes that day. Why? The answer lies in the very nature of modern federal criminal laws which have exploded in number, but also become impossibly broad and vague. In Three Felonies a Day, Harvey A. Silvergate reveals how federal criminal laws have become dangerously disconnected from the English common law tradition and how prosecutors can pin arguable federal crimes on any one of us for even the most seemingly innocuous behavior. The volume of federal crimes in recent decades has increased well beyond the statute books and into the morass of the Code of Federal Regulations, handing federal prosecutors an additional trove of vague and exceedingly complex and technical prohibitions to stick on their hapless targets. The dangers spelled out in three felonies a day do not apply solely to white-collar criminals, state and local politicians and professionals, no social class or profession is safe from this troubling form of social control by the executive branch, and nothing less than the integrity of our constitutional democracy hangs in the balance. So basically, any of us could be charged with any number of crimes. The only reason we haven't been is because presumably we haven't offended anybody with any real power. But politicians are constantly doing things that offend the powerful. So we have now pretty much opened the floodgates of the justice system to arrest virtually anybody in elected office. From now on, political candidates will not only need to spend a lot of time campaigning and fundraising, but they will also have to put together an escape plan in case they lose the election. We're actually watching our system disintegrate right before our eyes. If ever there was a time we needed to pray for those in authority, it's now. Thanks for watching and be blessed.